everyone. This is one session I'm sure many of you are looking forward to. The roundtable discussion should be as exciting as the title, Show Us the Money, Plastic Recycling's Potential. I would like to introduce the moderator of this session, Mr. Douglas Woodring, the founder and managing director of Ocean Recovery Alliance, a nonprofit organization focused on bringing together innovative solutions, technology, collaborations, and policy to create positive improvements for the health of the ocean. Two of its global programs were launched at the Clinton Global Initiative, and in 2018, he was awarded the Prince's Prize for Innovative Philanthropy in Monaco. He founded the Plasticity Forum on Innovations for Plastic in its Second Life. Last year, he co-founded the Commitments Accelerator for Plastic Pollution, a global incubator for plastic waste reduction programs. I now hand it over to Mr. Douglas for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Swaliha, and welcome to International Recycling Week. And here we are from Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, and South Africa. We have an amazing panel today, so we're going to get right into it. And I'm going to introduce each uh, speaker for uh, briefly. I'll let them introduce themselves. And then we have a number of great questions for this panel and uh, open to the public if you would like to uh, send in your chat. We'll try to get to that. So Max, Max Kripo, the chairman of the BIR, the Bureau of International Recycling, and the owner of uh, Green Core Resources. Max, can you give us a quick introduction? Hi, thank you. Uh, hello, good evening from uh, Singapore, Doug. Thanks for the quick introduction. So yes, I'm a chairman of the BIR, the World's Largest Recycling Federation, board member of the Plastic Committee, and as you said, owner of Green Core Resources uh, for the past 15 years, which is headquartered in Hong Kong with two plastic recycling uh, plants in Poland, as well as in Indonesia, where we received uh, more recently the first ocean bond plastic certification uh, in the country most responsible for marine plastic uh, pollution. Wow, that's great. Next, we have Ronald Richa, the general manager of plastic recycling at the Veolia Middle East and in Dubai right now. Hi, Doug. Hi for everyone from Dubai. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Ronald. I'm the general manager of the plastic recycling business uh, in, the, in the Middle East. I've been working for Veolia for the last 19 years. Um, I'm an environmental engineer and I have a master's in business administration. Uh, I work in the water field and in the waste management field. And for the last two years, uh, we've been structuring the plastic recycling business here with a, a new project that we uh, intend to build and to develop here in the UEE around PT recycling and food grade RPET. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here in this, uh, in this round table and I look forward to having this discussion with you and to answer the questions. Great, thank you very much. Next we have Johan Conradi in my favorite, one of my favorite cities, Cape Town. He's the director of MyPlast and the chairman of SAPRO. Johan, I think you're on mute. Probably the most most used phrase in, in the world at the moment. I think you're on mute. Um, yeah, welcome from a cold uh, Cape Town right now. Um, my name is Johan Conradi, as you just said. Uh, I'm a part owner and director of MyPlus. We're a polyolefin recycler in Cape Town. Um, and for all my sins, I'm also the chairman of the South African Plastic Recyclers Organization. We represent recyclers in South Africa. Uh, South Africa has quite an advanced recycling industry. We have about 250 recyclers going here at the moment, and uh, our post-consumer recycling rate is close to 46%, I think, at this stage of plastic packaging. Um, I'm also, I also sit on the Plastics SA uh, board, where we look at plastics in general in South Africa, um, and I'm also a board member or steering committee member of the South African Plastics Pact, which is part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, group of plastics pacts that's been started globally. Excellent, thank you very much. And lastly, but not least, we have Saeed Shahzad Alam, who's the Senior Procurement Manager at Unilever in the Middle East. Thanks, Doug. Uh, hi, hello from Dubai, very hot Dubai at 41 degrees centigrade here. Joan, just for you to know, I am Shahzad Alam. 
Uh, been with Unilever for almost 19 years now. By Ken Mix, I'm a mechanical engineer and a business graduate. And most of my time with Unilever has been in across supply chain and procurement and across different geographies of the world. And uh, this plastic subject is very close to my heart as well, uh, 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 from, from the passion perspective. And I'm looking forward for this great session today to share and to learn from the panelists and you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shazad. I'm going to put you in the hot speed seat since you're, uh, you're just speaking. So I'd like to start with the first question. What are some of the signs that the plastic industry is prepared to invest heavily or to, to really boost recycling rates in plastic packaging and other applications? Thanks, Doug. So, so look, in my view, I think uh, it's important to understand that most of the plastic uh, that we use follow a linear material flow. Uh, it is a valuable resource that unfortunately ends up in landfills uh, and not doesn't come back to, to us and hence impacts the environment after use. I think what's happening is that with increasing awareness on the environmental impact of plastic, uh, which is not used back, and the value it carries, there is a rising demand for, uh, for making the use of plastic better. I can give you an example of Unilever, for example. Uh, we are committed to drive less plastic, better plastic, and no plastic agenda. And our commitments by 2025 are that we will have the amount of virgin plastic that we use and with an absolute reduction of almost 100,000 tons of plastic by 2025. Similarly, we will also help collect and process more plastic packaging than we sell. And thirdly, we have to ensure that 100% of our plastic packaging that we are using is reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And last but not the least, we have to increase our use of post-consumer uh, recycled plastic in our materials up to 25% at the least. Now, why I'm saying that, uh, we are not the only one who are doing this, but we are certainly the pioneer and we are driving this. It means we are also helping to create an industry-wide drive by the recyclers, by the institutions, by the government agencies to support and facilitate this industry development. And that is actually happening, yeah. The objective here is to remember that this plastic, uh, unless it doesn't come back into the circular, closed loop circular economy, yeah, we are wasting this and treating this as a waste, not as a resource. Is it happening? Yes, it certainly is happening, but the pace needs to be, to be picked up. And I think uh, uh, in the whole value chain, uh, all the players which are involved from the use to disposal, to collection, to reuse, have to play an important role in it. Yeah. It is still happening, but the pace is slow. That has to pick up. Okay, that's great. So the number you just said, you didn't give an exact number, but the amount of uh, material you will recover uh, will equal the same amount or more of, than what you sell. And that's a pretty big number for Unilever. Do you or does anyone have the panel uh, on the panel have a, an estimate for the capacity investment needs to handle this uh, great demand in recycling that's uh, right around the corner? I can give my comment on, on behalf of what we're doing here in Unilever, for example. So look, uh, our total footprint is about 700,000 tons of plastic. We, the number looks big, but we are still very small compared to the global plastic consumption in packaging itself. Uh, uh, do we have enough investments? No, at the moment, not. Yeah, because that's not only about the investment, Doug. I think it's more about the whole value chain linked with how complex it is to collect the plastic after use. Yeah, how financially and technically feasible it is to process and bring it to a stage where we can use it as well. So it's not only about the recycling investment that is required, which is a set of machines and equipment that you can install. It's also the whole piece of, of uh, the infrastructure that will help bring the plastic after use to that spot. And that is not only the investment part, that's also linked with the, with the, with the lot of other players who are involved into the mm -hmm. whole process. Yeah, right. So, uh, Max, you are there. Yes, just, just to give another figures, if you take uh, the latest estimate, you have roughly today 13 million uh, of PET, which is used globally uh, for, to manufacture water bottles, I mean, beverage bottles. Uh, and you have roughly currently installed globally more or less 3 million tons of food grade RPET spread between the U Europe, the US, South America, South Africa, Asia, and so on. 
So if you take the 25% um, pledges, which uh, were mentioned uh, just earlier by Said, uh, you need more than 3.5 million today just to, to match uh, the 25% uh, pledge of most of the brand. But like recently, all those brands, not only Unilever, but if you take Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Danone, and like the biggest users of uh, RPET, they found a correlation between the amount of recycled content they put in their packaging and the sales. The more they put recycled content, the more sales they see. So today you have, for example, if you take the example of Coca-Cola, uh, in more than 30 jurisdictions across the globe, they already, for most of their uh, bottles, reach 100% RPT content. So like if you, if you stay at 25%, you need 3.5 uh, metric ton of install capacity to do our pet. If you move to 50%, it's seven ton. So we're far from what is installed. But as Said pointed out, even though you install more capacity, the bottleneck is related to the collection. And the collection so far is what lack because you don't have enough collection to feed all those machines. Right, so Johan, um, if the world's estimate is roughly what you hear, 10% of the world's plastic actually gets recycled, some countries a bit higher. Um, you've got 46% in South Africa for many things. Um, how, do, how did you get there? And, and the, my, the question I'm trying to ask is how much money do we need to invest globally to help the collection? It's not just, the, of course, the collection, but a bit of cleaning, sorting, grinding, and getting it into the system. How did you do that in South Africa so well? I think that's a, a really good question. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much we need, but I, I'm going to assume that it, it'll be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and that's US dollars, not Zim dollars. Uh, in South Africa, if we look at, at, at the way things have, uh, and how did we get to 46%, it, South Africa has a bit of a, a mixed economy. So we've got, we've got a lot of collectors out there walking around collecting plastics. But then we've also got a strong middle class that's, that, that demands uh, recycled content and has a sustainability perspective. But then also, uh, most importantly, and, and for me, that's, that's the closest thing to my heart, is that uh, demand really drives this industry. Um, I understand that in many countries like uh, Europe and so on, uh, they've moved beyond demand and supply is becoming an issue. But uh, in, the, in the countries where it's, it's still developing, um, let's say South America, Africa, even uh, North America in, in many ways, since they've, they've been exporting all their plastics over the, these last few decades. Um, the supply chains exist, uh, the MRFs exist, uh, but, but where do you go with that plastic? And, and when you do recycle it, uh, if you do have the capacity, uh, who do you sell it to? Um, convincing converters at this stage in many countries, we've, we've all seen that, uh, that inertia initially can be quite difficult to overcome um, as the momentum builds and as the as the commitments start coming through and as the pressure from the brand owners start coming through, um, it it uh, you know they they have no choice but to change. But to go back to your first question on whether we're seeing any changes in the market or whether we're seeing investment, I think we can just go to two of the largest recycling mag equipment manufacturers in the world, Starlinger and Nerima. And they've, between themselves, I think Starlinger just doubled uh, their capacity. And I think over the last three or four years, Arima has quadrupled their capacity. So clearly, it's clearly someone is buying the equipment. Someone is investing. Um, uh, it's happening. Uh, I think just more pressure from the brand owners and the retailers, especially. And, and we'll see the momentum just snowball. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, and I think any investors out there looking at up the supply chain of who's supplying that equipment, um, you know, you can understand a lot of what's happening. I think it's only the beginning of a big change. Ronald, um, what are some of the big loss-making factors which have made recycling so challenging uh, at scale? Um, you know, why hasn't it really happened? yet until here 2021 we're talking about these big changes okay. what have been some of the hurdles before just to come back to the to the first topic quickly um from veolia perspective we have been heavily investing in plastic recycling 
but um, the exercise we can see that this exercise has its limit and the project that i'm pursuing here in the UAE uh, concentrate to itself all the challenges of uh, the plastic recycling. Uh, lack of uh, regulations, uh, lack of incentives, even for the collectors or for the recyclers, uh, difficulties to convince brand owners, to convince converters, someone said it, uh, and, um, and a procurement strategy very much on the plastic, very much linked to the price of the virgin and the price of the crude oil. And this is something that is very painful and this is something that is very difficult when you are managing a recycling uh, project and you want to ensure its sustainability over time. How you make sure that this link is, um, I would not say stop existing but is less affecting your day-to-day -day business we can see that like one year ago the price of the virgin to talk about the pet for example the price of the virgin was around 700 dollars 800 650 depends on where to procure it and how you procure it now it's 1100 1200 and sometimes a little bit more uh, what was impossible last year is now possible and could be impossible next year if we continue in this trend so it's a it's a trend that at a certain point the more we go up in the value chain and try to produce high quality resins and this is what brand owners want they want high quality resins they want to integrate it in their food uh, food grade products they want to integrate it in very uh, a very specific type of product the more investment you need uh, the more quality control you should ensure for not only on the on, on on your facility on your production on your equipment and technology technology is always important and she had told us it's a, okay it's part of the game but the collection to ensure how you segregate at source you need to ensure that the quality of the bales when you put it inside your machines are quite good and so on uh, this is something that costs a lot of money and needs a kind of stable environment and ecosystem to evolve in this is first Second, the other challenge, and to come back to your question, is uh, the fluctuation of the price of the feedstock. We said that it's, it's difficult to find today a feedstock to put it in the machine. But even when you find it, in most of the country, it's a, spec it's a speculative uh, 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 feedstock or speculative uh, raw material. Uh, yesterday, like a few years ago, a few months ago here in the UE, the price was X. Now uh, it went up 25% more. I understand that companies and we, we operate MERFs and we are in this, in this business and we have to take advantage of the situation. But once again, if we are in a very speculative market, even on the feedstock, it's something very, very difficult. Last is the regulatory uh, framework. It's very important. Uh, when you are in Europe, the regulatory environment is becoming more and more clear and the standards are more and more clear. When you go out from Europe, it's a little bit more hazy. And uh, uh, to, take, to, to talk about the market where I'm, uh, I'm operating, uh, there's nobody who tells you don't use recycled plastic. But there's nobody to, to, that tells you use recycled plastic and if you want to use it, how to use it and right. under which conditions. Mm -hmm. And this is something that even though companies like Veolia, who has included the plastic recycling as a main pillar of their, uh, of their future growth, with a huge ambition of having 1 billion euros turned over from plastic recycling, which is, makes Veolia the, the leader in, the, in, in its market, is still somehow... I would not say hesitant, but contemplating the options whether to invest in some countries or not. And this is a big also gap that we need to, to bridge in the coming months and years in order to enhance the plastic recycling. No, no, that's perfect. I, I think you must have uh, had a sneak peek of my questions because it leads me to the next one. <laughs> and it's going to Max because I want to know to really what extent, as Ronald was alluding to, there's a decoupling if there is of pricing between virgin material and recycled content, especially with the demand from all of the Unilevers and bit large brands of the world. And then to uh, Shazad, um, you know, the price, if it is decoupling and you need to have recycled content in your materials, how high do you go? 
in a price differential to meet your uh, obligations, which are only a few years away, 2025. Max, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so actually, when people talk about price decoupling for recycled resin, this is this is happening for at least the past five years for PET. And especially uh, PET food grade uh, is the only resin so far which has experienced a real decoupling from Virgin. And, and despite the big crisis uh, during the COVID, you saw like the price of Virgin PET uh, like dropping at least by half during the worst moment of the COVID crisis. And despite that, the food grade RPT maintained, if you look at Europe, which is the best example, throughout the COVID crisis, it was like always in the range of 1,400 euro uh, when, when the price of the Virgin dropped as low as 700 US dollar per metric ton. So that's really the legislator, in my opinion, which can lead to those situations. If you have like mandatory recycle content, if you have legislation, which make it mandatory for the brands, maybe Unilever, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Danone, and all the others to, that, that, that make it mandatory to put at least 25% or even 10% or 50%, whatever the amount, this is the only thing that can uh, lead to price decoupling. And this is why so far, you don't see many other resins enjoying that price decoupling. You start to have it in Europe or in the UK with the plastic taxes, which they uh, start to implement. Uh, you start to have uh, LDPE and HDPE like start to decouple, but like so far only uh, PET and especially food grade or PET have enjoyed that kind of decoupling. So it will happen eventually for the other resins, but that is related to the, to the legislator. If the legislator make it mandatory to incorporate PE, PS, P, uh, PP, whatever uh, recycled resin, they will enjoy the same type of decoupling which we have enjoyed uh, for RPT and especially food grade RPT. Can, can I add one comment, if I may? Yeah. The decoupling, and I totally agree with Max that we started seeing this decoupling since 2018, um, 2017, 2018, and has been accelerated end of 2018, 2019. It's true, but the cost structure when you are recycling is not 100% decoupled. You have always to keep in mind that the price of your feedstock is still somehow, in a way or another, coupled. Though, therefore, even though you are decoupled from one hand, you are also uh, under the pressure of your feedstock that constitute depends on the present that you have to produce, the markets and so on, 30, 35, 40, 45% of your total price uh, uh, per, per, per ton of the final product. So yes, there is, uh, there is a decoupling with this on the PET and this is why, for example, we are uh, tr developing a PET project here in the UE in an uncertain market because we believe that this is, if we want to start by a resin, we will start with the PET. But at the same time, there's a pressure that is coming from the uh, uh, upstream of the value chain, which is the, 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 the feedstock itself, uh, the post-consumed packaging that is not really decoupled. And it's today, we can see it more than any time else, uh, that it's today a speculation product and everybody is trying to buy it and sell it, taking the advantage of the pressure that all the recycling uh, uh, demands in the world are putting on the, on the, on the post-consumed uh, 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 packaging industry. Shazad, can you... Uh... Yeah, thanks, Doc. So look, I... in... yeah, sorry. So, so look, uh, in my view, I think, yes, you're right. Virgin polymers do follow a certain correlation with crude, yeah? But it's not, it's not the only factor. I think it has been... Uh, lately, it has been equally driven by demand and supply as well in different markets. Yeah, we've seen that. But when it comes to recycled plastic, uh, I'm still trying to find out a reason for, for myself to understand that so far till today, most of the plastic is lending up and ending up in landfill. Doesn't matter how the crude moves up or down, how is it going to impact the recycled plastic? Because that was still going into a waste. I think the real factor uh, should be linked with the complexity and cost associated with retrieval of those plastic to bring it to a point where you can recycle it. That's a genuine cost. And certainly, the investment required to process it as well. 
if we see it from an ROI perspective, I think it will be giving a better protection to the investors as well, as Richard was right, rightly saying. If, for example, I link it up with the, with, the, with the origin price and the origin price goes down significantly lower and my PCR, my, my recycled plastic link is linked with virgin, I'm exposed financially. I'm not protected. Yeah. So I think today, yes, you're absolutely right. I think today it's an easier trend to follow for recyclers that link it up with the virgin so that uh, at least we have a certain correlation to follow. But it does not provide sustainable uh, uh, correlation or sustainable protection to either producer, recyclers, or to the buyers like Unilever as well. So when you, um, you know, not to put you on the spot, but uh, you, with your commitments, once you start using 10, 15, 30% recycled content uh, in two years down the road, there is a big price swing you know, to what extent are you able to bear that um, increased price versus trying to keep the pricing uh, relatively stable for the consumers? Look, so that so yes, so certainly, I think uh, the the uh, the way I would answer this is that uh, we are certainly trying to our focus is to build a collaboration to build this uh, this uh, infrastructure or recycle. Uh, investments in technologies into place. If we will have the capacities, we believe the prices will also come down, will also be stabilized as well. The right. core focus is is not to drive margin out of it. I think the core focus is that ambition that we are very serious about the impact of plastic. And we believe that it can be used multiple times. Unfortunately, it is not used. We are trying to leverage that opportunity. Right, so that's, but that's bringing economies of scale into this. So Johan, if you uh, do, is the demand in South Africa able to uh, absorb all of the recycling that you do there, or do you export pellets and some materials? And this will lead to the next question that someone else can answer. Um, you know, a lot of the world's manufacturing is not in the countries where they are headquartered. It may be in China or other places. So you need to get recycled content to the factories who are manufacturing on behalf of those brands. So Johan, are, are you exporting anything to China or other countries? And could someone else comment on uh, if a lot of this recycled content is going to the factories of the world uh, today? Well, not to China. Um, we do export from South Africa into a couple of, or into a number of African countries around us. I think it's important that we keep in mind that, uh, you know, we, we're talking today about uh, the Middle East and Africa mostly, and uh, I think it's it's vastly different from what's happening in Europe. You know, uh, Max was mentioning prices of $1,400, et cetera, for our pet in Europe. Um, we recently had a large listed company that closed down a enormous food grade uh, PT plant, I think it was uh, 25,000 or 28,000 tons a year capacity. And basically they closed it down because their agreement with a large off-taker was for, I think, virgin less 10% or something like that. And when the virgin prices dropped to $850, it just became unsustainable. Um, so uh, the market kind of factors are very different in Africa, well, definitely South Africa, I don't know exactly what's happening in the Middle East, but in Africa, definitely uh, the uh, legislative pressure isn't there yet. Um, I think Ronald mentioned earlier that uh, legislation is basically or has to be the driving force to take this forward if we want to see any any progress. Um, and lastly, I mean, uh, ARPET, if we look at Europe again, um, they've got so much legislation that prohibits the import basically of our pet from a country like South Africa, unless you know the original bottles were manufactured according to very specific European standards and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not always as simple as it is with maybe importing a TV from China or something like that. Right, that's great, good answer. Max, do you wanna say anything about that? Yeah, well, uh, following the China ban, like China, uh, overnight transform itself from being the world largest importer and processor of plastic scrap to the world largest importer of plastic recycled plastic pellets. Uh, but that was just for a short period of time because like 
all the Chinese factory moved to Southeast Asia and like started to import. And then those countries started to implement the same time of restriction for the import. And, and, and at the end, this business, which used to be like global, where you were shipping belt material and process and, and sorted material from Europe and the US to Asia, this is finished. This has changed. And you, you, you went from like a, a global business to a local or at least regional business. What you see now is that people recycling, investing in infrastructure locally, regionally, processing the material locally and supplying the brand owners with the material they need. So that is the big change after, after China then. Okay. So we, we have one question uh, from the public. It's, uh basically asking, this is for Shazad, if, if someone helps uh, invest in recycling capacities in the UAE, can they get into the uh, supply chain for Unilever's demands? Can they help you get, get involved in the UAE's recycling program, basically? If I understand and correctly. Ronald as well. So if I understand correctly, uh, the question is that if someone is willing to invest into recycling capacities in UAE, what yes. you, Unilever can do or play a part into it, is that in, in terms yeah, of collaboration, in, in right? Right. Absolutely. So, so look, we are absolutely open. We are absolutely open for that as well. And we actually are uh, working extensively, not only within the UAE, but globally as well. We are open for that. Of course, that's the only way that we will achieve our ambition and target by 2025. So they can reach out to me they, uh, and then we can talk. Great. Ronald, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, I mean, we are in this process in, in Veolia to, to try to invest to invest in, in the recycling business here in the UE and, and to build the hub for the whole uh, GCC. Uh, for, for sure, we are open for discussion, for new partnerships, uh, for new ideas, for new resins and so on. What is very important, and I think this is detrimental and crucial, is any partnership, or at least from our point of view, needs to bring the security needed and the, from security I understand. I, I, I mean the offtaking, offtaking the securing of what we'll do with the final material, and uh, and or uh, the input, the feedstock that is required. Um, offtaking is of essence with the absence of a clear legislation that uh, that makes the use of recycled resin mandatory. You need to secure yourself uh, with an offtake agreement. Uh, with a pricing structure that is decoupled from the price of the virgin and all the example and all what has been said during this session uh, goes into this direction and this is very important otherwise you will do your investment and you'll find yourself after one two three five years uh, with the obligation to close the doors and to shut out the uh, shut down the plant so open for discussion uh, what is very important is less the investment part uh, is less the technical part, the technology. There are a lot of technology providers. There are a lot of know-how. Is who is willing to buy this material and under which condition? And this is very important. Yeah, uh, Ronald, I think that's an excellent point. Um, the security needed at the end of the infrastructure investment, which is the demand and the buyer, and the recyclers of the world are really not necessarily you as the processor or Max but it's the buyer and user of recycled content. Because if there's no buyer and user, there's no market for you to sell into and no reason for you to invest. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need the uh, Shazads of the world to come out in force, I think. Um, someone asked us, I'll leave it open for anyone, is there a trustworthy source for plastic waste uh, that monitors the fluctuation in prices? Is there a way to monitor the fluctuation in prices? in a trustworthy way, online or anything that but you follow as a report. You have well, some Stan indexes, like yeah, Stan ISIS. Yeah, well developed plans. one. Johan, yeah. can you say that again? Uh, Standards and Poor's have that Platts one that Max just mentioned. Um, how accurate it is, it is at this stage, it's still early days, but maybe something like that is clearly needed. Um, so it would be good if people supported something. Okay. And my view, just to add on that, I think it also depends a lot on, it varies from country to country. For example, if you have got a formal collection process, uh, it will be properly regulated, structured by, by, by government organizations or private public-private partnership as well. 
you probably would have a better visibility of the quality and price and quantity as well. Uh, in many, many of the countries, like in most of the Asian countries, uh, uh, we have a lot of informal practices as well, which means it completely depends on, on isolated groups uh, of, of, of people or private institutions, for example. It's difficult to track what the price is. It, it may change and vary uh, uh, day by day significantly. Okay. Have any of you seen any impacts from the Basel Amendment changes, which came in in January? For those who don't know what that is, Basel Amendment, it's uh, the Basel Agreement was set up in 89 for the um, trading of hazardous materials. And just in January, a new amendment came in to basically call plastic waste a, a hazardous material, meaning that very maybe potentially difficult for countries to get feedstock from one to another. Um, has that been an issue? Mm-hmm. And that, that could be an issue for the brands to get the materials into the factories, right? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. We uh, were surprised to have it uh, by the beginning of this year. We, we, we had the shipment that were about to leave Jebel Ali port and they said, ah, you need the paper from the receiving authority because it has been changed. The regulation changed like two days ago. Yes, it's making now the, the, the trans frontier shipment of plastic as difficult as hazardous material. Now, it's, we see it as, as an opportunity. And as Max said, it's becoming this, the recycling needs to be and to become a local market, a local circuit. Regional, maybe, but local first and foremost, locally, whatever plastic you are putting in your market, you tend to collect it, to segregate it properly, and to put it back through a certain transformation system to your, to, to, your, to your system. And it goes along all the policies, commitments of the brand owners that wants to ensure that the plastic they are putting, the packaging they are putting in the market are, are collected, well segregated, sorted, and so on and so forth. Yes, it's a challenge, but I think it's a, it's a positive way uh, to push towards a more local uh, recycling industry in each and every country. Okay, so uh, just maybe to follow up on that, someone just asked, is there current legislation in the Middle East that allows for bales and flakes to be traded between countries in the UAE. Is it, uh, has this impacted the, the, well, or the Middle Eastern country trade uh, different than Europe to you Middle East trade? We, we don't see any, any specific impact on the trading uh, uh, mechanism here in the Middle East. You know, it's not a structured market today when it comes to recycled product. It's still an immature market. It's not a. It's it's a formal market because uh, I mean by that these are players. It's not a, um, a pickers or whatever that collect these. It's, uh, these are big players that are uh, uh, operating uh, sorting facilities and so on that are trading. Uh, but uh, what we start seeing today is the emergence of platforms, trading platforms, and this is structuring the market more and more. So using the digital, using the, all these trading platform to structure the market and to give visibility to companies like Veolia, who has an ambition of a recycling facility uh, on the price. Because before, when I started this project two years ago, I tend to go to all the sorting facility and all the collectors and ask them one by one, what is the price today? And this one will give you 100 and the other one 120 and the third one 150. Today, with by centralizing through few platforms, it's giving some more visibility and some more transparency of the price. Yeah, and that's key for the investment in long-term uh, stability mm-hmm. of the pricing and expectations. Yeah. Um, we talked a lot about PET. Um, someone is asking about PE and PP and some of the other plastics. I think, Shazad, you mentioned that a bit, but is are there um, some trends on some of the less easy materials that... Uh, Maybe someone's not thinking about that you that you see something interesting. Any of you? True, uh, uh, Doug. So we we certainly HDP uh, is quite a significant material for us in our uh, plastic composition, and uh, we can't have uh, meet our target unless we have a solution for a recycled HDP material as well. Uh, we have multiple collaborations and, and capacities which have been signed off globally within Unilever. 
and some of the markets we are still developing as well. Uh, if, if the question specifically is about uh, the GCC region, we have signed an MOU with uh, uh, one of the key uh, waste management company here in UAE, which is BIA. And the MOU is, is, is actually an intent to think about how can we put a RHDP plant in place. And I would link it up with, uh, 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 with the previous comment that Risha was also talking about. I think, look, uh, such, such, such regulatory bans for the free flow of material from one country to another, I think if you will look at it as, as a barrier or we will look at it as a base of our investment, I think that will be, be a challenge for us. We have to see it from that perspective that whatever material that we are using today as a virgin is still going into the same economy, that's still there. So it means the only thing that we should be thinking about making the investment is how can we leverage that? It will be too complex to access that, absolutely right. But that's the right thing to do from the day one. Yeah. And if, for example, it's, it's possible, and in some of the market, we are doing that. We have got some very good examples in North America and Europe where we are able to access all the local plastic waste and put it back into the system. And that's the most sustainable way to close the loop locally. Okay. We have a, only a few more minutes since I'm uh, from Ocean Recovery Alliance. And oh, Johan, you had a quick comment? Yeah, just quickly on what Sayed just said. Um, uh, we just have to keep in mind that again, to, to be the African uh, voice yeah, that, you know, if you go into many of the African countries, and there are a lot of them, um, there is no capacity for conversion. There's no capacity for recycling. The packaging that is being used in these countries are very often coming from Europe um, and the likes. So there needs to be some form of way for them to at least be allowed to bail their plastic and and ship it back to Europe where, where it's originally coming from in many cases, or South Africa, if it's a South African Unilever, for example, that's producing it and selling it in, let's say Angola or somewhere. But the odds of, you know, if there's no Unilever plant there and there's no converter there, and, and then there's not gonna be a recycler there either, um, where's that waste going to go to? Yeah, excellent point. That's a sort of one-way trade. It goes in, but it can't go out. So that, that's excellent. That, that's a big log jam. Uh, since I'm with Ocean Recovery Alliance, last question. Um, how has the effectiveness been so far in uh, with the consumer goods or any other companies in sort of um, trying to prevent and alleviate ocean-bound plastic? That's uh, material that's maybe 50 kilometers near the ocean. Um, you know, Max, do you see certification of this material uh, helping the the waste and the, the, the water systems and getting into recycling? Yes. So first of all, you had a lot of buzz around this term of ocean plastic, ocean bound plastic. So first of all, ocean bound plastic is the real issue because like 80% of the plastic you find in the ocean uh, come from land-based uh, sources. When it reaches the ocean, it's too late because it starts to decompose because of the soil, because of the UVs and so on. So the key is to prevent these ocean-bound plastic from reaching the ocean. Prevention instead of cure. And like lots of brands are getting more and more interested in incorporating ocean-bound plastic uh, in their products, maybe bottles, maybe different type of packaging, even luggages and so on. Uh, but at the end, the consumer is aware of a lot of greenwashing around this ID and certification is key to give the authenticity that the consumer is expecting and, and to give peace of mind to the brand owners. If the brand owners want really to incorporate ocean bomb plastic, they need to have a, sol a rock solid certification be behind uh, the material that they are buying from. And so far, like, we've been looking for more than a year to find a proper certification program because you have a lot of people that claim they are ocean bound that they claim by themselves they don't have any verification and like right. last year actually you had one, one company that started to have the first certification program backed by an ngo french ngo called zero plastic ocean and audited by control union independently. So we've been with this certification program in Indonesia, which is considered as one of the most, if not the most uh, responsible for plastic pollution. And we uh, received the first ocean bond plastic certification in Indonesia. So it's, it's very important certification uh, to give uh, authenticity uh, to the brand. Excellent. Well, with that, good, uh, good ending comment. Um, 
from International Recycling Week, um, Shazad, Ronald, Johan, Max from Hong Kong, Dubai, Cape Town, and Singapore. Listen to the crowd roar. They're cheering at all you guys. Thanks for the great panel. And we'll see all of you next year, either in person or back on this good webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thanks.